Buenas tardes, tengan todos ustedes. Es un honor para el Instituto de Investigaciones Filológicas, es un gusto enorme tenerlos eh, aquí. Eh, el hecho de que físicamente el Instituto sea anfitrión de esta Cátedra José Gaos, eh, agradezco y celebro eh, eh, la visita de todos ustedes, de la doctora Olbert Hansberg, de otros investigadores del Instituto tan cercano, tan cercano no solo físicamente, de investigaciones filosóficas y que nos una la figura de José Gaos, que tan importante es tanto para la eh, filosofía como también para las letras en general, para la cultura mexicana. Yo recuerdo eh, algunas de las participaciones del Instituto en actividades relacionadas con la figura y la personalidad de José Gaos y... Eh, me, en este momento lo que voy a hacer es darle la palabra al doctor Pedro Estepanenco, director del Instituto de Investigaciones Filosóficas, para que él nos cuente algunos de los aspectos relacionados con la Cátedra José Gaos. Bueno, pues bienvenidos, buenas tardes, bienvenidos a esta decimosexta edición de la Cátedra Gaos. Como ya lo dijo el doctor Vital, me voy a tomar unos minutitos para contar un poco la, la historia de esta cátedra. Lo primero que tendría que hacer y no tenía preparado es distinguirla de la Gaos Santander. ¿no? Eh, nuestra, nuestra cátedra es más antigua, es desde 1980, pero creo que en los 90 se inició la otra, la otra cátedra Gaos Santander que administra la Coordinación de Humanidades. Entonces, lo primero es distinguir la Cátedra Gaos o José Gaos del Instituto de Investigaciones Filosóficas de la otra eh, Gaos Santander. Eh, y nuestra cátedra se inició en 1980 eh, como una cátedra extraordinaria del Centro Universitario de Profesores Visitantes, eh, que hasta donde yo sé ya no existe ese centro. Eh, y bueno, fueron varias cátedras extraordinarias que se dieron a varias entidades de la universidad, al Instituto de Investigaciones Filosóficas, eh, bueno, se le dio esta cátedra extraordinaria a José Gauss y el primer invitado fue Donald Davidson, eh, que eh, ofreció la cátedra sobre filosofía de la acción. Eh, en 1983 se le dio a Ernesto Sosa, eh, que habló sobre intencionalidad, en 84 no sé exactamente lo que sucedió, me da la impresión de que fue medio compartida con la facultad. En fin, son cosas que quizá la doctora Hansberg luego nos pueda platicar con, con más detalle. Lo cierto es que en 87 hay todavía eh, o, otra cátedra Gaos eh, propiciada por el Centro Universitario de Profesores Visitantes. Eh, esa le fue concedida a Ernesto Garzón Valdés eh, sobre sistemas políticos. Y ahí es donde viene un, un brinco, eh, hasta 1995, en donde eh, la Cátedra Gaos eh, ya no está propiciada o ya no estuvo propiciada por el Centro Universitario de Profesores Visitantes, sino que se fundó a iniciativa de la doctora Olbert Hansberg, que era directora en ese entonces eh, de Filosóficas, eh, se creó un fideicomiso eh, y, y desde ese momento la organización de la Cátedra José Gauss depende exclusivamente del Instituto de Investigaciones Filosóficas. Hay un fideicomiso, todavía tenemos dinero suficiente para eh, varias eh, cátedras más, pero tenemos que pues, eh, llenar el cochinito para que pues, tenga futuro. En 1995 eh, y en, en 1995 y en 1996, Primero vino Scott Soms y, y luego Manuel García Carpintero, que eh, ofrecieron la cátedra sobre verdad y significado. En 97, Barry Strauss sobre metafísica del color. En 98, Larry Laudan, no sobre filosofía de la ciencia, sino sobre el liberalismo. En 99, Remo Bodei sobre pasiones políticas. En 2001, Dorothy Eddington sobre probabilidad. En 2003, James Griffin sobre derechos humanos. 
en 2006, Timothy Williamson sobre metodología filosófica, en 2007, Javier Muguerza sobre ética, en 2011, Robert Stalnaker sobre filosofía del lenguaje, en 2012, Ian Hacking sobre filosofía de las matemáticas, en 2013, Agustín Rayo sobre espacio de posibilidades, sobre metafísica. Eh, bueno, estas es son más o menos eh, la, la, las, las personalidades que, que, han, que han, nos han visitado eh, en ocasión de la, de la Cátedra eh, Gauss. Y en esta ocasión viene Ned Block. And it is a great pleasure to introduce Professor Ned Block, to whom we thank uh, for accepting our invitation to give the Jose Gauss uh, lectures. Ned Block, as most of you know, is professor of philosophy, psychology, and neuroscience in New York University. And before coming to New York, to NYU, he was professor and chair of the philosophy program at MIT. He has mainly worked on, on philosophy of mind. And in 1995, he published a very important paper on a confusion about a function of consciousness, where he distinguishes two kinds of consciousness, access consciousness and phenomenic or phenomenological consciousness, uh, as he put it. And, and, and he argues there also that most of the new th theories of consciousness are only concerned with, with, with the first one, with access consciousness. And since then, 95, he has been working hardly on the nature of consciousness. And now, well now, since five or six years ago, in connection with attention and, perte and perception. And that's, that's uh, the, the, the issue on which he will uh, give uh, these talks. So once again, it is an honor uh, for the Institute uh, that you accepted uh, our invitation to give these Jose Gauss lectures. Please. Thank you so much. Antes de darle la palabra a nuestro eh, ponente, nuestro conferencista, déjenme decirles que ya en la sala hay 65 personas y eh, que hay una eh, transmisión por YouTube de, de este acto académico. Entonces, creo que eso también es digno de celebrar. Bienvenido. ¿Es mejor para mí usar el micrófono o no? But yes is not an answer to this or that. <laughs> um, well, thank you for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, so the, um, the, the lectures are going to be about the, what I say is a joint in nature between consciousness and cognition. That's uh, something doesn't like that subject. <laughs> um, the, the first two lectures are going to be about a, a joint in nature between perception and cognition. Um, then the next two will be about the capacity of consciousness perception compared with cognition. And then I will give uh, one lecture on the disconnect between representation and conscious perception. And then the last one is going to be about attention and conscious perception. So the first is this um, uh, uh, seeing as concepts and non-conceptual content, um, uh, which I discovered that I've given here before a year ago. It's, uh, I, it's not exactly the same, but I don't know how many people were at that one. Oh, so uh, yeah, so quite a few people were not there. So yeah, so good. <laughs> um, okay, so the, the general theme is going to be that conscious perception is not constitutively related to cognition, representation, or attention. It is just a sui generis uh, aspect of the mind. Um, okay, so today is seeing as in the light of vision science. And the main idea here is that philosophers have underestimated 
the extent to which the following issues are empirical, even experimental. Uh, one, whether seeing must be seeing as, whether seeing is exhausted by seeing low-level properties, shape, spatial relations, motion, texture, brightness, color, body, those are the low-level properties, uh, as opposed to high-level properties like seeing something as a building or as a car or as a, um, a person. Um, whether seeing as is conceptual, what, what the distinction is between perception and perceptual judgment, and uh, in the last lecture, uh, I'll get to how unspecific perception is. Um, uh, a long tradition in philosophy says that the questions that science answers are not the questions that philosophers have been interested in, and Wittgenstein is a good example of this. Here is a, 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 a famous uh, passage. Um, imagine a physiological explanation for my seeing one thing A as a variation of the other B. It might come out that when I see A as B, certain processes take place in my retina, which otherwise are found when I actually see B. And this might now explain some things in my behavior. It might be, for example, said that that is the reason why I'm seeing A, I behave as if I were seeing B in a way I don't ordinarily behave when I see A, but I don't see it as B. But for, and here's the crucial part, but for, but for us, this explanation of my behavior is superfluous. I accept the behavior just as I accept the process on the retina or in the brain. I want to say, at first, the physiological explanation is apparently a help, but then at once it turns out to be a mere catalyst of thoughts. I introduce it only to rid myself of it once and for all. So I'm, my talk is going to be directly opposed to this idea. Um, I think it's not true that, uh, that vision science is irrelevant to philosophical concerns about seeing as. Um, and I'll, I'll get back to Wittgenstein and Charles Travis, uh, uh, who has Wittgensteinian ideas towards the end. So first I'm going to talk about the role of concepts in seeing as. I'm going to distinguish between a kind of non-conceptual seeing as and a conceptual seeing as. And then I'm going to talk about low-level versus high-level seeing as. And all around, I'm going to be concerned with the issue of whether a scientific approach inevitably substitutes technical questions for the kinds of ordinary questions that philosophers are interested in. So just a brief um, um, uh, mention of Wittgenstein again. So this is really Brian O'Shaughnessy on Wittgenstein. So Brian O'Shaughnessy says, according to Wittgenstein, the work of the understanding lies at the center of visual perceptual experience. And what he means by that is that concepts are essentially involved in seeing. That seeing is seeing as and seeing as is conceptual. He quotes a few things from Wittgenstein, um, uh, where Wittgenstein, for example, says, I do not merely interpret a figure, but I clothe it with the interpretation. Um, now, of course, Wittgenstein is notoriously difficult to um, interpret, but um, he takes these remarks, I and mean, he spins a whole story about why it is that Wittgenstein sees seeing as conceptual. So I'm opposed to that. I think seeing as is, there is an important visual seeing as which is non-conceptual. So, but this brings up the issue, what do we mean by concepts and conceptual? So let me uh, uh, try to explain this via a, a kind of a, um, a little bit of an intellectual joke. So this is a, a joke at the expense of Bruno Latour, who famously claimed that Ramses II could not have, uh, have died of tuberculosis since tuberculosis had not yet been discovered when Ramses II lived. And he said, before Koch, the bacillus had no real existence. To say that Ramses II died of tuberculosis is as absurd as saying that he died of machine gun fire. Um, so what mistake is, is Bruno Latour making? He is confusing the concept of tuberculosis, which was developed in 1882, from tuberculosis itself. Um, Ramses II did not die of the concept of tuberculosis. He died of tuberculosis. Um, OK, so it's the concept. And this is, I think, actually in, in a kind of, there's a kind of French philosophy that just makes a practice of confusing concepts with the things that they are concepts of. It's almost uh, like a principle of thinking. Um, um, 
so, but I'm trying to make a, 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 a strict division between concepts and what they're, so on the upper part of the, of the, of the slide, you see the, 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 the mind, and I think that concepts, the way I like to use the term, are predicative elements that can be constituents of thought. So that's clearly on the mind side. Concepts are mental things. Um, uh, and then there's the, the, the world, on the side of the world, there are things and properties like the property of being deadly as opposed to the concept of being deadly. Now, um, the uh, very odd uh, uh, intellectual piece of intellectual history, which is this Wittgensteinian view, or perhaps Wittgensteinian according to um, 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 some people, um, that, that seeing is, is conceptual, is also held by a, a very anti-Wittgensteinian philosopher, Jerry Fodor. And Jerry Fodor is very explicit about it, so let me uh, read you what he says. He says, there's no seeing a thing without seeing it as something or other, and when something looks to you to be something or other, you must have some or other concept that it looks to you to fall under. So the chain of inference goes. No seeing without seeing as, no seeing as without conceptualization, no conceptualization without concepts. Thus do intentionality and conceptualization enter into the psychology of perception and they enter very early. Um, now Fodor's reason for, for thinking this is this. He says, all the, it's very different from anything Wittgenstein would have thought. All the perceptual representations that are accessible to consciousness exhibit constancy effects and by pretty general consensus, constancy effects are the product of inferences. You cannot, for example, see the retinal color of a thing, i.e. the color of the light uh, the thing actually reflects to the eye. Infer and he speaks of inferences that correct for various factors. And here's the kind of thing that he's thinking about. So the figures at the back look like the same size as their, their normal sized people, but if you move those figures to the front, you see that the brain is doing some serious correcting. They look absurd when they're absurdly small when they're in the front. And you, you, just to show that I'm not faking anything here. Um, <laughs> um, so those are the constancies that Fodor is talking about. Um, and he thinks those constancies are the product of inference. And since there's inference, there's got to be concepts. Now, this, this notion of, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say much more about this notion of inference, but uh, I, I believe this is a, a mistaken point of view. This is a... a, a uh, what I regard as a, a pernicious metaphor introduced by Helmholtz uh, and taken overly literally. The idea is that whenever there is, in some sense, more in the percept than is in the um, uh, light waves hitting the, the, the retina, you speak of inference. Uh, there's something the visual system does that um, gets rid of most of the um, ambiguity in the retinal array and um, uh, many people regard this as inference, but um, I think very likely many of these things are subpersonal architectural features. So here's an example. Um, uh, the see the word convex in the arrows. Um, is that visible? Okay, so the the arrows are pointing to convex things, and I'm going to rotate that. And there's no trickery here. This is just the same as if I'd rotated a piece of paper. And you'll see that well, the things that are now convex become concave. OK? Now, why does this happen? It happens because the visual system treats shadows as coming from light from above. The, the visual system, in some sense, assumes that light is coming from above. But is this a premise in an inference? I don't, there's no evidence of this and I really doubt it. I think the system is simply built to treat it that way. And so I would not regard this as good reason to, this as a kind of good reason to believe in, in, in inference and perception. So this is Fodor's argument. And let me just mention an alternative point of view which I'll be using throughout the lectures. I like this, this is Tyler Burgess point of view in his 2010 book. The idea is you have features of the world like the redness of the fire hydrant. You have sensory transducers that 
turn that into a, an, a perceptual representation which has a singular element which we could represent in English with that and a general element that is attributed to the referent of the singular element. Um, and so far, this is completely non-conceptual. And then you can conceptualize that and get a basic perceptual judgment where the, the predicate or attributive, as Burge calls it, is conceptualized, turned into a concept that's in the thought system. So there's the lower border of perception and the upper border of, of, of perception. And here's the upshot of this for what I'm saying. There is a kind of seeing as that is non-conceptual and is involved in all perception. All perception attributes um, uh, properties to things or places, okay? So that's the basic sort of assumption that I believe um, um, is uh, derived from vision science and shows that all seeing is seeing as. There is no seeing that does not attribute some kind of a property. Um, and the point here is that the properties that are attributed are part of a non-conceptual representation. Uh, so they don't have to be in the thought system. It's a further intellectual step to form a basic perceptual judgment, uh, like that is red. Okay, so it just says what I said, and of course this is this idea that, that um, um, concepts, um, that, that, that uh, uh, um, percepts are, are, are not predicative elements and propositional structures, uh, that is they're not concepts in my terminology, that's, that's, that's definitional. Um, so just to say what my criticisms of Fodor is, uh, are, so he says the first premise is no seeing without seeing as, no seeing is as without conceptualization. So in the sense of concept that I'm talking about, that's not true. His third premise is no conceptualization without concepts, thus do intentionality and conceptualization enter into the psychology of perception. Intentionality comes in much earlier with the non-conceptual percept. So that's the point of view that I'm, I'm uh, expressing. Um, now, there is a verbal issue here, what, what you mean by concept, but there is a not verbal issue, which is, as I will be arguing, that there's a joint in nature between perception and cognition, and that there's a form of seeing as that falls completely on the perception side, not on the cognition side. So those are not verbal issues. They do not depend on how you decide to you know, define the word concept. So just to say a little more about the percept-concept distinction, which is going to figure heavily in what I'm going to be saying throughout the, these lectures. So I take so I think there, there are two basic kinds of differences between perception and cognition. There's a format difference and a computational role difference. The main format difference is that perception is constitutively iconic or image-like, whereas cognition is in part non-iconic. I say in part because you can use images in your thinking. You can use perceptual representations in your thinking. You can think that looks red and therefore something. Um, so there's no bar to images in thought. Um, I also, it's part of the idea of this iconic representation that the per representations of, Im of, of perception are not um, uh, propositional. They do not um, uh, make a statement. They assign a property to a place or a thing. They're feature placing. And I think if you look at the perception literature, you'll see that that is the way the models work. They're all feature-placing models. Um, okay, but the, you know, these things do need a lot of articulation. And, and um, uh, one, just to make ideas clear, what is, just to say a little bit about what an iconic representation is, there's a lot of disagreement in the literature. This is a very big topic now in, in, um, um, uh, in analytic philosophy to say something about the um, pictorial versus non-pictorial representations. And I think it is in part due to an increased interest in aesthetics. Um, there are many people working on this now. There's 
that for a while there were lots of articles that then, then almost none, and now there's suddenly lots more. So if anybody wants references, I can refer you to many of these articles. Um, Okay, just to say a little bit, I'm not saying this is the God-given definition of an iconic representation, but it is one way to think about them. So here's an iconic representation. So one way of saying what it makes it iconic um, is that there are systematic parts of the picture that represent parts of what the whole represents. I know, can you see the little circle I've, dr I've drawn around the kind of hand part? Is that visible? Yeah, good. Okay, so that's a part of the picture that represents part of what the whole picture represents. Whereas if you look at a, a discursive representation like the Queen of England and look at its parts, they do not typically represent part of what the whole represents. England is not part of the Queen, okay? Now it can happen that by accident that uh, a part of a representation represents part of what the whole representation represents, but it's not a systematic feature of discursive representation, whereas it is a discursive uh, feature of iconic representation. Of course, you need, to make this work, you need some notion of a primitive part. Um, so iconic representations that are primitive do not themselves have parts that represent parts of what the whole represents, but they're part of a system in which there are non-primitive representations. Anyway, so there's, there's just an, a, a, something I'm throwing out to, to say a little bit about this. Now, of the computational roles idea, this idea of cognitive representations as inferentially promiscuous, meaning they can be substituted as a premise in reasoning freely, that's controversial. And I'll say more about that on Wednesday. The Wednesday talk is going to be about the joint in nature between perception and cognition. Um, not particularly per conscious perception, but perception and cognition. And I'm going to say more about this inferential promiscuity and the, um, the last item on the list, the, um, um, uh, the idea of cognitive penetrability, which means that the, um, uh, the cognition, cognition does not, uh, cannot reach in and, and uh, uh, change anything in the perceptual system. Uh, but that'll be next time. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the conceptual versus non-conceptual seeing as and about the low level versus high level uh, distinction. It's kind of useful to talk about this. Um, this is a review of Burge's book uh, by Andre Begbie. So and it's kind of useful as a, for me as a foil. He says, he, meaning Burge, acknowledges that we also have, that we have perceptual beliefs which are not basic but rather perceptual in a broader sense, namely those that involve familiar everyday objects such as baseball bats, CD players, hybrid autos, and so on. What can we say about these? Burge's response to my mind is to my mind a letdown. While they do not involve conceptualization of perceptual attributives, what? I think what he must mean is they do involve conceptualization of perceptual attributives. Um, but the important part is they depend for their empirical application on perceptual attributives. At, attributives for baseball bats depend for their application on the size, shape, and color that baseball bats in fact have. The implication, if I understand Burge here, is that we do not perceive CD players and baseball bats, but only reliably form beliefs about their presence on the basis of perceiving attributes such as color, shape, and texture. So he means we do not, he doesn't mean you don't see a baseball bat, right? Everybody knows you can see a baseball bat. He means we don't see them as such. So the, the, here's the, the idea behind Beg, Begbie here. If you look at a baseball bat, it looks like a baseball bat. But according to Burge, probably that is not a visual representation. We don't visually represent something as a baseball bat. We represent it in terms of low-level properties. And then we, we form the judgment that it's a baseball bat. But it's not a, a perceptual state. The baseball bat doesn't enter into the perceptual state. He finds this disappointing. Why does he find it disappointing? Well, he finds it disappointing partly because, well, for two reasons. One is, it looks like a baseball bat, so that ought to be in the visual system according to him. This is the main fallacy in talking about seeing as, in my view. Going from the idea that it looks like a baseball bat to vision represents it as a baseball bat. 
So the big issue here is distinguishing between visual representation of low-level properties like color, shape, texture, and visual representation of involving the visual attribution of properties like baseball bat. This, philosophers have tried to approach this a priori in their artwork, at least in their armchair. It's not an armchair issue. There is a real empirical question, which I'm going to be talking about, about whether attributives or representations like baseball bat are in the visual system. I think probably not for baseball bat, but probably yes for face and some other more biological properties. And I'm going to try to show you some of the evidence that actually counts on this. The main, but the main intuitive point here is you cannot assume that just because something looks like a baseball bat or a CD case, you cannot assume that just because it looks like that, that, the, that vision represents it as a baseball bat. Okay, that's the, that's the main idea. A second feature that I'm going to get to is the, and this is more by way of an objection to views like mine, is that, okay, so these guys say to me, okay, so vision doesn't represent something that's a baseball bat, but that just shows that something's wrong with the way you talk about seeing. This vision science stuff, it just isn't, doesn't make contact with our ordinary ways of thinking. Because ordinary ways of thinking are, um, say that, we, that vision does represent, seeing does represent something as a baseball bat. Okay, So I am going to say something about that. I think that's dead wrong. I'm going to say why. But the first step is to introduce the methodology for how we know whether we perceive CD players and baseball bats as such. So many philosophers have said, like for example, Susanna Siegel, I believe gave a talk here recently. Um, so she has argued in her book of like 2011, I think, that the representation or contents of visual experience go beyond basic, these low level properties. That's her list of low level properties. And she thinks vision represents high level properties like causation, being a dog, being a pine tree, John Malkovich. But her arguments are entirely armchair. Now I happen to agree with her about causation um, not about being John Malkovich, but the main, my main point is methodological. You cannot solve this problem from the armchair. So let's see. Let me just say a little bit about learning. This is a bit of a kind of a tangent, but I just want to get this out of the way. So if perceptual representations are learned, doesn't that show they're high level? Answer, no. And this was shown by Mary Peterson at the University of Arizona um, and, and some wonderful uh, Studies. Let's see. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be able to point here. Not point here. Uh, let's see. I have a pointer somewhere. Sorry, I should have gotten a pointer. Okay. I've got a battery. I've got a pointer. I have all this stuff. Ah, oh, no. Okay, so what Peterson showed, this is one of her early articles in a wonderful uh, paradigm. Uh, so these, these are figure ground, familiar figure ground displays. Now you're much more likely to see the black uh, as figure than the white, because you can see the white as figure. And if you look here, you see this is a, a, a face. You can see that as figure, this is a, a profile. Okay, so here's the thing. You're much more likely to see the white as figure here then you are likely to see the white as figure here. Okay? Now why is that? This is a profile of a standing woman. This is a profile of an upside down standing woman. You don't typically see that profile. Um, so what she showed was that our, our experience changes how we see figure and ground. Everybody understand what I was saying? Um, so we do learn, and in fact it changes it quite quickly. When, you're, when you see various outlines in the world, that changes how you see figure and ground. You're much more likely to see the white as figure when it's a familiar profile. In fact, as I'll, uh, I'll point out later, that works even whether or not, oh, is this a pointer? No. Whether or not you know what the thing is, okay? It's entirely low-level vision. You don't have to know what that is to be more likely to see it as, as 
the widest figure. It's a very important uh, point that I'll come to. So the fact that perceptual ex uh, expertise improves with experience does not show we perceive high-level properties. Those are, well, those are low-level. The, the figure ground segregation is one of the earliest parts of vision. So the questions I'm going to ask are, are there any high-level perceptual representations like face or cause? Can we acquire new ones? And are there culturally constructed ones? And unfortunately, I only have real information about the top one. But, um, but the methodology I'm going to suggest uh, can, is in principle capable of answering all those questions. It's just that there isn't that much uh, um, known about the, the, the others. So here's an outline of the rest of the talk. I'm going to talk about what I call the recognitional coextension problem, um, and then the, I'll get to the other things. So the recognitional coextension problem is first. So I'm going to talk about high level versus low level perception. And then I'm going to move into, on to the much harder topic about distinguishing perception from perceptual judgment. Okay, so those are the two basic subjects of the rest of the talk. High level versus low level, how to distinguish them. And the second is how to distinguish perception from perceptual judgment. Okay, so high level versus low level. So these are pictures I got on the web by typing in a family resemblance. So uh, um, why do I do this? Because we can recognize family resemblance ob uh, uh, categories. So this is a, a Michael Posner's wonderful paradigm. So you, he makes random dot pictures and then distortions and distortions of those. And people can categorize those very easily. You, can, you, you give a name, to a nonsense name, we can categorize them. So, we can put together categories of um, low-level properties, you know, conjunctions of low-level properties. And so that gives rise to this recognitional co-extension problem. How can we tell whether we have a perceptual attributive for faces as opposed to a family resemblance cluster of recognitionally co-extensive low-level perceptual attributives or represent attributive is a word for representation. So what is recognitionally coextensive? By that I mean that a high level attributive like being a face, or sorry, the representation of a face is recognitionally coextensive to a low level attributive um, or a cluster of them if they are coextensive to the extent that we can recognize them. So I'm not saying that there are high level, that there really are any low level properties that are equivalent to being a face. No, they're equivalent to being a face or maybe looking like a face or something like that. That's what I'm talking about. So we can ask the question, are there family resemblance clusters of low-level properties that are recognitionally equivalent to, say, faceness? I'm going to use faceness as an example because there are a lot of experiments on, on being a face, okay, and facial expression. So that's it's a really good example. So... If it's true, yes, then how do we decide whether we're using those attributives rather than face? If no, then we can wonder how the visual system can detect faces at all. So the answer turns out to be yes. And the reason for this is that um, uh, high-level perception can be entirely bottom-up. Um, and this is shown by some wonderful work by the psychologist Molly Potter. An early paper of, of hers gave pictures like this she gave a description first, and these pictures came very, very fast. Uh, and then subjects could do quite well in answering them, even though they, 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 they came so fast, suggesting that there can be very quick recognition. It didn't show that it's entirely bottom up, but some later experiments of hers culminating in a 2014 paper, published, I should say, while she was in her 80s, um, Really, this, one, this paper really nails it. So she does a similar experiment. They're much faster. And she shows, and these are examples of the descriptions. So you get a whole six to 12 pictures coming very fast for incredibly short periods, 13 to 80 milliseconds. And then there's a brief 200 millisecond pause, and then you get a description. And you have to say whether the description, like swan, traffic jam, boxes of vegetables, whether those descriptions apply to one of the pictures you saw. So a very fast sequence of pictures. So the things she showed was, were that 
It doesn't matter much whether the description comes before or after, so you needn't get the description beforehand. There's no major effect of the number of pictures suggesting that we recognize things very, we can rec recognize things quite quickly. Um, um, uh, uh, and then there's not much of a serial position effect. Each of these papers is, a, each of these pictures is obliterated by the next one, which comes very soon. It's a phenomenon called masking. You have to do it very quickly. Um, serial position, it doesn't matter much whether the thing is first or last. So again, another suggestion uh, uh, that, that you know, you'd expect the last one to be a lot easier because you have more time, but your people are doing the first ones well, even without that more time. And, this, and it doesn't matter very much, or there's, I, should, that's, I should say, it's not that it doesn't matter, there's no discontinuity between 13 and 80 milliseconds. Um, so, as she says, a feed-forward account of detection is more consistent with the results, suggesting that a presentation as short as 13 milliseconds, even when masked by following pictures is sufficient on some trials for feed-forward activation to reach a conceptual level. So we can recognize things pretty well just with a purely bottom-up process. So that suggests we really do have to deal with the, the recognitional coextension problem. So as I said, there are two issues here. There's the recognitional coextension issue, high versus low, and then there's the, um, the distinction, distinguishing a perceptual representation from from a cognitive representation, that is perception and perceptual judgment. So here is a, an example that may illustrate this. So that looks pretty causal, like the red thing hit. <laughs> okay, so this one looks much less causal because there's more of a delay. So the first one looked causal, but here's the question: Is that looking causal? Is that really? How do we know that it is? a genuinely perceptual representation as opposed to an overlay of perceptual judgment on low-level perception. That's really the, the, the issue. And I'm gonna, here's some proposed solutions, okay? So um, the solution I'm proposing is this. Test whether representations are perceptual by finding out whether they participate in perceptual phenomena. But wait, you may say, I'm defining perception in terms of perception. How does that work? Um, that seems like a very small circle. So the answer is this. Perception is a natural kind. If we can find phenomena that group together, that contribute towards a, a, a pointing at a common answer, and some of those phenomena are clearly perceptual, then the ones that aren't clearly perceptual can be lumped with the clearly perceptual. So what we're looking for is items in the natural kind, and I'm going to show you some examples. Okay, so here's an example of, of what is clearly a perceptual phenomenon. This is called perceptual pop-out. And the idea is if you're asked to search for the red uh, circle in that, you can do it way faster than you can find the red circle in that. How do we know this is perceptual? It depends on perceptual similarity, okay? That is, what makes this hard is that there are lots of similar items that are, can be confused with the one you're looking for. A second point is it works just the same in humans as in animals even animals without, apparently, without a huge amount of perceptual judgment. These are, are graphs for pigeons, okay? So this is how long it takes them to find something like this, depending on the distractor set size. That's 12, 24, 36. The answer is for pigeons, as for people, that the distractor, it doesn't matter whether there are 36 of these, or 24, or 12, or 100, for that matter, okay? It takes them the same amount of time, no matter how many there are. But if it's situations more like these that are less that are more perceptual, where the distractors are more perceptually similar, then it does depend on the distractor set size. So that's a, a pretty standard example. Okay, perceptual pop-out then looks to be a perceptual phenomenon. Okay, so there's reason to think it's a perceptual phenomenon, and now we can test whether we have 
perceptual pop-out for faces. Find the face. So how many found that pretty quickly? OK, so in controlled experiments, there's pretty good perceptual pop-out for faces. Right there, we have an, a, a piece of evidence that the visual system has an attributive for faces, OK? Because there's perceptual pop-out for faces. Um, so this, it's, this is called parallel versus serial search. Whether the, the idea is does it depend on the dis number of distractors? Per parallel search is a, research, is a result of perceptual pop-out. It's based on perceptual similarity. So this is a, a, a method that we can use to try to figure out whether the visual system has representations for certain things. Now, there's a, a better method which is, uh, uh, that I'm going to spend some time on called adaptation, which has been described as the electrode of psychophysics. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. So I want you to stare intently at the red dot, OK? Um, and I'm gonna, you're going to have to do that for 30 seconds. And then I'm going to show you another display. And I want you to say right or left, depending on which is more. So just to test here, which, so what would you say if you saw this display? Left. Louder. OK. So keep staring at that red dot. Don't stop staring at the red dot. It won't work if you don't do, do this. Stare at the red dot. Not everybody is staring at the red dot. Please stare at the red dot. OK, in a minute, I'm going to show you another display. Remember, you have to say right or left, depending on whether it's more or less. Are you ready? Yeah. One, two, three, go. OK, now, if you keep looking, um, what you'll find is actually the same number of dots on both sides. So what happened here? What happened here, so oh, here's what happened. Um, what happened is, you, so how many got that effect? How many didn't get the effect? Oh, okay, some people didn't get it. Okay, I don't know why that would be. Um, you know, it's not laboratory conditions. So here's the, <laughs> here's the idea. You're staring at this. You have visual representations, unbelievably but true. You have visual representations of numerosity, okay? Visual representations of numerosity. And what happened was your visual representations of numerosity on the left got fatigued. Your channel and the ones on the right got fatigued for low numerosity, high numerosity here, low numerosity here. And then when you saw these two that were equal, it looked the reverse of this. Everybody get the explanation? So it presupposes that you have channels that involve perceptual representations of high numerosity and low numerosity. So this is a, you know, uh, uh, oh, so I didn't say, uh, yeah, so, um, so, OK, so that is a high level representation that we have excellent evidence for. You can vary the low level properties and still get a, uh, um, uh, still get a considerable effect. If you vary the low-level properties, it won't, the effect won't be as big, but it will be there. Okay, so that's a pretty. So this is the basic paradigm that I'm going to be talking about, with many, many interesting variations. I'll, I'll give, I'll show you a few more. Let's see. I guess I'm using up my time, so maybe I'll go right to this one. Um, um, okay, so stare at that. And then I'm going to show you a, um, a face, and you have to say um, angry or fearful. You have to say it very quickly, because these adaptation effects go away very fast, OK? So you have to say, I want everybody to say the word angry or fearful um, out loud. When you see the next one, it's going to be in the middle. OK, so if you were just doing this one, what would you say? OK, ready? One, two, three, go. OK, now we'll do that again. OK, now stare at this one.
Okay, so, okay, good. So that's the one that looked angry at first and fearful second. It's the same picture, the same picture. It's a morph of angry and fearful, and you saw it as more, more of you saw it angry at first and fearful at second. So it's a similar phenomenon. It's that there are, there are perceptual representations of angry and fearful that get fatigued, and when the, 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 the angry one gets fatigued, you're likely to see a morph as more fearful, um, and, 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 so, uh, and so on. So, um, all right, so here we have a kind of experimental paradigm that seems to, um, uh, gives a pretty strong, at least initial indication that we have um, um, uh, uh, high level representations for, for face, uh, uh, sorry, for facial expressions. Um, now, you can't prove, this doesn't prove that the, that the representations are high level. To, to, really pr to really nail it, you'd have to vary a lot of low level properties. And, you know, perceptual psychologists have done some stuff, some experiments in that direction. When you do vary the low level properties, you find that the effect has become smaller, but it's still there. So there is some independent effect for high level properties. Um, so I'm running a little low on time, and I'm going to move to a, um, an, another, just the last of these experiments involving adaptation. So this is an experiment uh, from Eleanor McCone's lab. So what Eleanor, so the, the basic uh, idea of, of Eleanor McCone's, um, this, this, of this, um, uh, uh, this, this experiment, is that adaptation effects transfer from one thing to another. So for, if you look at an elongated ellipse, so we're, this, these are elongation and squatness, okay? Whether something is stretched or, or squat. Everybody know those terms? Um, okay, so these, um, what she, uh, uh, here's what, this is a clever idea. You know, philosophers sometimes say that uh, something can't be shown. And this is a good experiment because it, it does kind of illustrate how clever people can be. So what she noted in, in, in doing the experiment, she noticed was that you can distinguish faces in terms of kind of a T-shape, and then you can distinguish T's in terms of T-shape, how, so, how, how squat they are and how elongated they are. So these are more elongated, these are squatter, and the same thing with your faces, okay? So here's what she asked. She asked the question whether if you adapt to a squat T, whether that makes a, a, a face, an intermediate face, look more elongated. So look, let me just make, make clear. If you adapt to a squat T, it makes another T look more elongated. If you adapt to a squat face, it makes another face look more elongated. Okay, so you adapt. Like, like with the other things I showed you, you adapt to uh, these visual properties and it makes something else look the opposite. Uh, okay, so what, what she wanted to ask was, if you had the uh, T's or F's as adaptors, would it transfer to the other one as adapt T's? These are not true and false, these are T and face, okay? So here's her reasoning to the extent that the transfer is low level, her term for, let's see, do I have, uh, her term for, for low level is shape generic. Um, then you, then there's no reason to um, um, expect any differences among FF, FT, and PFT. To the extent that the transfer is face specific, you would expect um, uh, that no transfer, okay? And what she found was quite interesting, which is that roughly half of the effect is, is low level and half is high level. So here's a quotation from her article. 55% of the after effect for upright faces had a face specific origin, while 45% had a shape generic, high low level, um, shared between faces and T's. And um, she nailed it by looking at upside down faces where it's almost all low level. Okay, so um, um, uh, there we have some evidence that um, for um, high level versus uh, that the perception involves high level properties. So look, the basic idea is you cannot just uh, conclude from um, um, uh, the fact that something looks like a baseball bat that we have a visual representation of a baseball bat. 
and is a genuinely visual one, you need some experiments like these. You need to look at adaptation experiments, whether you get adaptation for baseball bat properties, okay? So my guess would be that you don't. Um, okay, so let's see now. Uh, let me move to the, I'm, I'm running short on time, I'm afraid. Let me move to the, I'm gonna change subject. So that's basically the, the main empirical part of the, of the, of the talk. I'm now gonna to move to the question of, of um, whether this is all irrelevant to our philosophical concerns. Whether this is just like technical scientific stuff that does not speak to our ordinary philosophical concerns. So remember uh, Begbie says, um, that uh, we don't perceive CD players in baseball bats. Um, in other words, baseball bat is not a visual representation. I gave an earlier version of this talk in Oxford, and Tim Williamson said, in the scientific sense of object C, we don't see New College, in his college. It's called New College because it was new in the 14th century. <laughs> really, it's really true. Um, okay, so he's making a similar point that, that there's this terminology from vision science that's not our ordinary terminology. So the common theme is, what I'm saying is just technical stuff that doesn't answer ordinary questions about what we see, because we do see new college. Okay, so I'm gonna give you my response to this criticism. My response is, if we ask the question, um, which has the most alcohol of all these drinks, we immediately get a division depending on whether we mean weight, mass, or volume. Um, the point is that an ordinary question can have a technical answer and a technical answer that genuinely answers the question. Just because there's some technical terminology does not mean that it's not relevant to ordinary philosophical concerns. So I think a useful way of putting this is to distinguish between primary and secondary seeing. So primary seeing is visual representation applied to what the visual system regards as objects, things, things, bodies, as Burge calls them. Secondary seeing is hybrids of visual representations and conceptual representations. Um, uh, and that these, these hybrids can be applied to things that are not visual objects um, on the basis of the visual objects that compose them. Like it can be applied to new college because we can see the parts of New College. I don't know if, you, if you've ever been to Oxford, but you know, it's, it's all this. New College is a very distributed thing with many different buildings. And, um, so, and then the, the, another thing is we can see property instances. So the idea is that baseball bat is a hybrid. It's, um, we are, 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 when we say something looks like a baseball bat, we're, we're, com we're, we're combining um, 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 uh, perceptual and conceptual representations. And New College is composed of visual objects, but it's not itself a visual object. So in the scientific sense of object C, we don't see New College, says Tim Williamson, but we can say, using slightly technical notions, but ones that do respond to the ordinary concern, we primary see some of the objects that compose New College. We apply primary visual attributives, um, both high and low level, and the basis of them, we can apply the concept new college and, and so see secondary seeing new college. So a non-technical question has a technical answer that answers the question. So that's my response there. Um, let me move now to personal versus sub-personal representation. So there's a, ma a major movement in, in uh, philosophy of perception exemplified by Charles Travis, which says that there are no personal level perceptual representations. Naive realism is one form of this. Here's Travis on this. He says, um, um, what he says is, oh, okay, there can be some personal visual representations. Nothing, nothing in what he's been saying, he's been saying that there are no visual, no, no personal level visual representations. Um, nothing in this makes it illegitimate for cognitive psychologists and their accounts of sub-personal processes involved in vision to speak of representations on which computations can be performed. My own view is that for such things to serve their explanatory ends, there's no need to see such representations as committed to anything being so, or as mistaken, or, or, or not, so as mistaken, um, or not accordingly. They may simply represent, say, a color edge being at a certain position without representing it as so, that it is actually there. Now, I think there's something right about this, because I think what he's really 
probably talking about is that the visual representations are not propositional, which I agree with. But this does not count against perceptual representation having accuracy conditions. If I perceptually represent something as red, my perception is accurate if and only if the thing I'm um, representing as red is red, okay? Um, and the, um, just because there's not a proposition doesn't mean there can't be accuracy. That F is accurate just in case that is F. Um, further, the color, shape, and texture representations that are recognitionally uh, um, um, equivalent to these uh, uh, representations like the kind I've been talking about are actually better candidates for being subpersonal. Angry face, fearful face, fe I didn't mention, but gender is actually one of the things you, that we have high level representations for. So these are very good candidates for being personal representations. So the results that I've mentioned do really suggest personal level representations because they're directly relevant to personal level concerns. The color, shape, and texture representations that I um, I argued are not the only ones, are indirectly, only indirectly relevant. So the results I'm mentioning do suggest that, that Travis is wrong. He says representation yields only mediated awareness of what it represents. Uh, but look, representation is part of the machinery by which we're aware of the world. We don't have to be aware of those representations. He says, there's nothing I've argued in a perceptual experience to make it count as having some one representational content as opposed to countless others. So he's, he thinks there's, there's vast underdetermination, but the adaptation methodology that I, I've been mentioning is directed towards saying which content. Okay, I'm gonna have to skip the next section because um, um, otherwise I won't get to the concepts. So I have to go directly to the next one. Percepts versus concepts. How do we know that adaptation targets percepts rather than concepts? So I showed you this one before. Now I'm going to show you a different one. This is ambiguous between what you just saw and something different. What you just saw was causal launch, two moving disks, OK? The green disk moves, hits the red disk, then the red disk moves. What I'm going to show you now is something that is ambiguous between that and one moving disk that changes color, okay? Now, the display I'm going to show you is a bit problematic. Um, here's the thing, I'm gonna show it to you a few times. The problem is you may not get, the, it, it, it can take very long to switch from one item of ambiguity to the other. You may see it once, one way, and then it may, I, I may have to stop before you can see it the other way. Um, so be, be careful to notice how you see it first, okay? Uh, you can change sometimes by looking at the thing in per peripheral perception, that is, by focusing further down on the page, on the, on the screen. So what you're gonna see, so it's, it's two moving disks versus one moving disk, that's the difference. Okay, so here we go. Um, so notice what happens first and then what happens later. Oops, where is it? Okay. So how many are seeing both interpretations? How many are seeing non-causal pass? How many are seeing causation? So some people are seeing some people are seeing one. Some people try looking in peripheral vision. So far, nobody has seen both. Anybody seen both? Okay, now some people have seen both. Okay. <laughs> anyway, look. Let me stop this and say what the point is. <laughs> okay. So here's the thing: you get adaptation working on this, changing the interpretation. That change of interpretation has got to be perceptual because it's, it's an individuation difference between one and two moving objects and whether something changes color. That is, just the, that is just so obviously, at least partly, perceptual, okay? So I claim that this is a case of adaptation 
that shows the signs of being at least a partly perceptual phenomenon, even though there is a judgment involved. Okay, here, uh, when the subject says it looks fearful, uh, it's, a, it's a perceptual judgment, but is there also a perceptual representation? Um, okay, so one thing that you can say is that the probable evolutionary explanation of adaptation is that the perceptual systems are interested in news. Cognition is interested in old but important facts that can be applied again and again, like lions are dangerous. You don't want to adapt to that. Um, so there is a kind of evolutionary reason for thinking that ad adaptation effects would be perceptual rather than cognitive. I don't know of any evidence for um, uh, cognitive adaptation effects, but you know we have to keep an eye open to see whether it can be ruled out. Here's another kind of uh, experiment. So this is a, a thing where you put a, a, a coil on the head. It's called transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, and uh, you, um, uh, you can use it to decrease adaptation to motion, OK? When you do that, the motion perception improves. You can see motion more accurately than before, suggesting that it is a perceptual improvement, OK? suggesting that the adaptation was perceptual. The point is, you don't get a perceptual improvement by changing your judgment. People can see more things than they could before, suggesting that the adaptation is perceptual. So here's another um, uh, item. These are perceptually ambiguous stimuli. They show three uh, properties, exclusivity, which is you don't get or only briefly get both. Inevitability, if you stare long enough, you will change. Um, and randomness in the sense that the, you cannot predict from one alternation how long it is to how long the next one will take. So these are, these are well known to be three. These are, and these, these, these are due to adaptation um, and uh, affect many different phenomena, okay? So, um, uh, uh, now, the, so the question is, is, is this perceptual or is it conceptual? Okay, I think there's reason to think it's, it's purely perceptual. Here is one reason. So these are uh, figure ground, more figure ground stimuli. Um, I hope that you will not know what some of the white things are. How many see some of the white things without knowing what they are? Oh, good. Um, here's the thing. Subjects saw the fam more familiar white shapes as figure faster and can maintain them longer only when the figures were upright, which suggests a perceptual component, and whether or not they knew what they were. Okay, so I, I, these, are, these are stimuli where you're not, you may not know what they are. I, mean, I can tell you what they are if you're interested. Um, uh, but they, it works whether you know what they are. Again, suggesting this is perceptual, not conceptual. Here's a more kind of anecdotal, philosophical kind of thing. Uh, we're all used to these philosophical conundra, which are in some sense ambiguous in the sense that people can go either way, whether X, Y, Z is a kind of water uh, or whether it's a different kind of stuff. You know, the familiar uh, moral psychology puzzle, whether it's okay to push the fat man off the bridge. Um, people know about that? Um, whether Searle's Chinese room understands Chinese. Here's the thing. When students may vacillate about these things, but once you've, you've, you've you know, dealt with those things for a while, you have a stable opinion. You don't just vary every time you think about it. But for a, for a perceptual case, um, perceptual ambiguity, no matter how many times you've seen it, it still fluctuates in accordance with those three principles. Um, so this is some reason to suggest, that, to, to suspect that um, um, Adaptation is a perceptual phenomenon, not a conceptual phenomenon. So on this issue of concepts versus percepts, that transfer of adaptation uh, from elongation to squatness, that really does seem obviously perceptual. The non-causal ca past case seems perceptual, and that's also adaptation. Uh, the improvement of perception in transcranial magnetic stimulation, also perceptual. Figure ground when you don't know what it is. Now, I put the next two in smaller type because I, I think they're a little flaky and anecdotal, but I think they're worth something. The evolutionary argument I gave and, and the idea that perceptual ambiguity doesn't adapt. Um, uh, 
the philosophical ambiguity doesn't do that. So the point is, on percepts first, the other things I think is more systematic evidence. On distinguishing perception from cognition, it's tentative, piecemeal, and conjectural. Um, and you've seen a lot of examples of those tentative, piecemeal, conjectural things. So my substantive conclusions, we can distinguish empirically among high level and low level. Um, the holistic constellations of low level uh, that are recognitionally coextensive with some high level um, representations and the conceptualized representations that are constituents of thought rather than perception. Those are the substantive conclusions. The methodological conclusions that I mentioned at the beginning, philosophers have underestimated the extent of, of experiment, the extent to which these issues are empirical, whether seeing is seeing as, whether seeing as is exhausted by low, seeing low-level properties, whether seeing as is conceptual, what the distinction is between perception and perceptual judgment, and the last, which I haven't gotten to yet, but I will get to in the last lecture, how unspecific perception is. Now, what is the relevance to other philosophical issues? So in philosophy of mind, whether there is a distinction between perception and cognition, and if so, what it is, that's clearly a, an important issue in philosophy of mind, not just in some empirical stuff. Um, the same methodology can, in principle, determine these answers to these issues about un, unspecific perceptual contents that I'm going to get to later, uh, which are relevant to general issues in philosophy of mind. In epistemology, whether perception has content at all, um, denied by direct realists, if so, what kind of content, high level versus low level, is relevant to the justification of perceptual belief? And you may have heard about that from Susanna Siegel, who's working on that topic now. In, and, and in addition, in the philosophy of philosophy, as Tim Williamson calls it, it's a test case for the role of science in philosophical reasoning. So what I believe is that there is considerable relevance to um, um, other philosophical issues, and it's a philosophical issue um, of, uh, of interest on its own, and that's the end. I'm sorry for going a little bit over. Why don't we, why don't we go right to questions? I don't think we need to. Uh, What? What? So, could people hear that? Yes, so the, the point is, I am saying there's a joint in nature between perception and cognition. And he says, uh, correctly, that if you look at the brain, there's no dividing line. It's not like there's this one perceptual part and this one conceptual part where you can draw a line. It just seems they just completely interpenetrate each other. And, and he didn't mention, but he would, I'm sure if we let him uh, go further, that there's a lot of feedback. In, in, in the brain, and, and um, feed, you know, feedback all the way to the earliest perceptual areas. Um, feedback, you know, the light comes in your eye, it's processed in, the, in this lateral genuclei, uh, nucleus in the middle of your head, goes to the, the first cortical area, V1. You get feedback all the way to the lateral genuclei nucleus, 
Um, uh, you don't get feedback for the retina, but you know, anybody who said that perception ends at the retina would not be saying anything very plausible. Um, so this is the topic of, to of Wednesday's uh, talk. <laughs> um, but let me say a little bit about this. Is, uh, uh, so just to just briefly mention some of the history of this, of this topic. You know, there was a view in the 1950s called the New Look. Actually started in the 1940s. Jerome S. Bruner is a, uh, w associated with this. Uh, uh, the New Look in Perception, it was called, that, that said that. Um, then that stuff fell out of favor, and modularity of mind was introduced by, by Fodor and Pelyushin. Um, and now there's been a new New Look, um, partly driven by neuroscience for the reasons you say. Um, OK, so I'm an, a, a proponent of the old look. <laughs> Um, and I'll, I'll say why next time. I, I, so it's, it's, it's uh, uh, I agree with a lot of what you said, uh, but I, I think there's, it is possible to make a dividing line. Thank you. I have um, many questions, so let me just uh, focus on, on the some problems for the methodology, which I anyway find uh, very interesting. Uh, the first one uh, has to do with uh, pop out. This is one of the effects that you characterize are as perceptual, but uh, compared to the case of fatigue, which is which uh, you mentioned that you don't know of any results showing this effect in purely cognitive situations. Uh, I suspect that there is such a thing as pop out in uh, cognitive, I don't know of any evidence, but just uh, <coughs> to raise some doubt. Um, also related to that, in the background and foreground uh, situation, you wanted to argue that this is a <laughs> perceptual effect, but in, in one of your examples, we were seeing uh, a couple of boots. And I get, my guess is that you don't want to say from, from what you say at the beginning, at the ver that we don't see uh, baseball bats, and I was thinking that I'm, I'm pretty sure that if you, that's my uh, out of the sofa uh, suggestion, that if you use Mickey Mouse ears, uh, you're gonna see this kind of effect. So I was wondering whether, if that were the case, then Mickey Mouse, <coughs> Mickey Mouse ears would be uh, perceptual. So we were perceiving Mickey Mouse ears, and uh, just, the, the last thing, I wanted to know a little bit uh, about the relation between low level, high level, and, and cognitive um, effects, because when I started thinking about that, I thought that cognitive, uh, cognitive vision, so to say, cognitive uh, visual judgment depends on high level properties, uh, on, on perception of high level properties and not on perception of low level properties. So some of the effects, so I had in mind the Margaret Thatcher effect. What? So Margaret Thatcher effect? Margaret Thatcher. Oh, Margaret Thatcher effect. Margaret Thatcher effect. So it's yeah. uh, in this effect, you, you see a house uh, upside down, and it's uh, distorted, but you see it as a proper as a proper face. Uh, now, if in this effect, we would expect the effect to be low level because the effect, as if I could follow, when the faces are upside uh, upside down, we don't see the the uh, high level kind of effects. But then in order to explain this kind of experiment, we were to, to explain it in terms of a cognitive judgment using only low level properties and that, I don't know, maybe you can say something about, about, about this if my question is understandable. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, I wish I had a Margaret Thatcher. So the, the, the illusion, he's, the, the case he's talking about um, is the so-called the Margaret Thatcher effect is uh, if you see Margaret Thatcher's uh, face and then you 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 turn her mouth and her eyes upside down, it looks horrendous. Um, however, if you then rotate the face to make it upside down, you can't really tell the difference. Okay, um, so so you're saying is that so? What I'm saying is that uh, that. Uh, Nice if we don't expect it by high level 
problem is because the face is upside down. So we ha have only the cognitive judgment and the low level properties. So the cognitive judgment, which, which we do that the face look normal, something like that, uh, would be based on low level properties. I don't know how this seems to. Con I, I feel Maybe this I'm is on, I feel this is on my side rather than opposed because um, uh, when it's right when it's upside down, uh, we don't we, we don't apply our, our, our high I, you know, face is a high level attribute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, we don't apply those, so we're just seeing color, shapes, and textures, and everything looks normal. When it's right side up, we have trouble applying the face attribute because it doesn't really look like a face. So. It, when it's upside down, we would say that is the, the, the perceptual judgment is that we see a normal face yeah. upside down. But we have to do it only on the basis of low-level properties. Yes. So what's wrong with that? Uh, no, no, no. The, the, the problem is that we have uh, high-level properties which is not based on high-level properties. That, I was wondering whether this is problematic because the structure, the cognitive structure that I was figuring out is low-level properties. We, we form... We have high level uh, representation, higher, high level uh, representation, but then our visual judgment depends on high level ones. But do you think that they can I, also I'm, depend? I'm really on not getting it. So, what's high level about the upside down face? You mean the eyes and the mouth? No, the the face. The upside down face. Yeah, in the upside down face. But the evidence is that I presented from the McCone um, is that when it's when it's faces it, when it's face, upside down faces, it's all low level. Exactly. So the, the judgment that we make that... There is an ups, their judgment is there is an upside down face. There is an upside down face. And it's based on low level properties. So what's wrong with that? Properties. No, nothing. I, just, I, w I wanted just to ask you whether uh, you think that the cognitive uh, uh, judgment are based on low level or they are typically based on high level. Ah, so that's I why I, I was expecting a hierarchy or something like that. That's, that's, oh, yeah. That's I think they're based on both. So you, about the Mickey Mouse ears... So here is the, uh, this is, these are the boots. So I would expect you would get similar phenomena for Mickey Mouse ears, because after all, you've seen many Mickey Mouse ears, <laughs> just like you've seen many boots. <laughs> so the important point here was that it works whether you know what it is or not. Um, and there was another point, now I've forgotten. Pop -out. Uh, ah, pop yeah, cognitive pop-outs, yeah. Um, you know, I'd like to hear some examples and then look at them. In, uh, now, I, I agree that, there, that, that sometimes things, yeah, there may be something you might call pop-up, but it, I don't, look, cognitive, uh, perceptual pop-up is very tied to this parallel search idea. Now, whether you get anything that would be called cognitive pop-up that would be an equivalent of that. Look, you know, this is something that is not, as far as I know, has not been investigated. I don't, I don't think anybody is working on this kind of thing. You know, it would be worthwhile doing, especially now that this, um, the issue of whether there is really a joint in nature between perception and cognition is such a hot issue. It would be kind of fun to uh, try to look at some of these perceptual phenomena. Um, maybe you and Mathieu could do it. <laughs> What is the role of memory? Uh, here. I can't see who's talking. Here, here. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. What is the role of memory in perception? Uh, ah. Can memory can dis distort or modify our perception? Sure. Um, uh, how or? Well, the most dramatic case is when we superimpose one mental image on another which I, I will mention a case like this later, uh, I forget in which lecture, but uh, we can superimpose an image on another image. And it, most people can do this, actually, surprisingly. Um, so that's a memory image being used to modify perception. Another, here's another uh, um, uh, fact, which is, uh, um, okay, so in the, there are very few color receptors in the, um, outside, uh, in the uh, per periphery of your vision, uh, color receptors in the, in the retina get, get uh, sparser as you go towards the periphery of, of, of vision, yet you see the whole visual field is colored. It's usually thought that's memory color. That is, that the visual system supplies, um, has mechanisms for um, um, uh, 
supplying apparent color even in areas where it's not getting much color reception. So there's a huge role of memory in, in, in perception. Because I have a question, and I thought on the question before you raise the hand. So let me. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. Let me put. Uh, let me make the, the the question. Yes, I wonder whether your characterization of of concept is complete, because you you take a concept as a constituent of thought that allow us to make inferences. But there is another function of concepts that the philosophical tradition and even uh, contemporary philosophers like McDowell stress uh, a lot. And it is uh, that uh, concepts are representation that allow us to recognize particular subjects. And in many of the stuff that you presented, uh, it seems to me that the, the, the ability to recognize uh, objects is present. So uh, the question is also, uh, why not to accept that there is some function of concepts in the low level process uh, and distinguish it from the other uh, characterization of concepts as constituents of, of concepts uh, related to inference and, and, and all that stuff. Okay, my reason is that I think there's a kind of rec non-conceptual recognition as well. You know, when you have an iconic representation of something, say, as a fearful face, mm -hmm. that F, it's the iconic, that is itself a kind of representation. So I think any seeing, a recognition rather, any seeing as could, is, could be called recognition, so I think there is both conceptual and non-conceptual recognition. So um, I agree that conceptual recognition is part of perceptual judgment, um, and that that is an important role of, of, of concepts in forming perceptual judgments. Maybe I should add that to my, my list. Let's say I prefer to be louder. Uh, so I, I could understand uh, that someone can see, let's say, a baseball bat without applying the concept of being a baseball bat. To it. So you could ask him, "Is it a baseball bat?" And the person may say, "I, I don't know. I haven't thought about it." The same with concepts like uh, being made of wood or being a, a sports item or what have you. But it's it's hard for me to imagine that we can see stuff without applying at least very general concepts to those things. So when I see something, you know, it's, it feels like I'm applying the concept at least of, of being a thing. If, if you ask the person who's seeing the baseball bat, are you seeing a thing? Uh, if, the, if the person understands the meaning of the word, it, he should say yes. So are there some experiments uh, that, that could help me understand why it's, it, it's possible for us to see something without applying very general concepts like this? So I'm not claiming, I mean, I might actually claim this, but uh, it's not part of my, what I said today, that, we, that in, we, when we have percepts with non-conceptual content, that there is a, not also conceptual content. So I think usually, I, in the usual case, um, here, let me go to the Burge thing, um, just to find it here. Um, so the usual case, I think, I, I would agree with you, that we 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 form a we usually form a perceptual judgment. Now I, I'll tell you, but I can think of two cases where I think this might not be the case. So one is with newborn babies. Um, the perceptual systems of newborn babies are working pretty well. They can recognize a lot of things, but some horrible experiments have shown that they're, um, uh, well, <laughs> I don't even say what they are, um, that they have very little um, uh, uh, frontal 
parts of their brains are have very little connectivity. There's very few frontal synapses, very low level of myelinization, which are the things that make neurons conduct. There's, there's not much operation of anything you would call a concept, especially in a, in a, in a newborn, but there's a lot of, of, uh, of visual processing and a lot of motor processing connected vision. I don't know if you've ever seen these wonderful videos. You can I think you can find them on YouTube of a newborn baby imitating a parent sticking out his tongue or opening his mouth. So these are probably um, um, uh, do, uh, largely due to per the perceptual parts of the brain and subcortical parts of the brain and do not probably do not involve any anything you could call a concept. So I think there is a lot of um, there's, there's a number of reasons to think that there, there can, in, in newborn babies there can, and you know, even in two-year-olds, there is non-conceptual, without conceptual appreciation of color. You know, uh, I'll mention later in, in, the, in these lectures, there's, there's this phenomenon that anybody who's had anything to do with, with, uh, with you know, toddlers, um, it, it was, there's a term that was coined by a psychologist named Nagel in the early 20th century. The term is farbendumite, color stupidity. And you know, uh, uh, Charles Darwin had the thought that his children were colorblind because they were so bad at assigning colors to, uh, to learning color names. So you know how we, we see objects, we see highlights, okay? You know, little glints of light, but we don't take them as important. Like they seem like, you know, transitory properties of things. We don't even notice them usually. Kids are like uh, very young children, but in, up to two years old are like that for colors. They just, they can't use co colors to, to tell whether there's one thing or two things. It's, it's really quite startling how, how unsavvy they, conceptually savvy they are about colors. So I think there is a lot of non-conceptual perception, even in, in young humans, without perceptual judgment and concepts. And of course, there's insects, you know. You know, uh, as Burge notes, the, the, the jumping spider can identify and track and ambush its prey. There's really very little reason to believe that the jumping spider has any concepts. It's all done, you know, it's all visual motor. On the issue of whether there is a substantive issue here or if it's just terminological, you pointed out that uh, you're, you're claiming that there is a natural joint between perception and cognition and that uh, that is a substantive matter. I was wondering whether someone that thinks that uh, conceptual content runs all the way through the, uh, uh, pers every perceptual, uh, every precept, let's put it that way, could accept that there's an interesting distinction, the distinction you're calling the joint uh, but deny that it's between perception as opposed to cognition. And so then there wouldn't be a substantive issue because uh, all the evidence you, you would provide for the joint would be evidence for an interesting distinction in two types of things, all of which are in some way cognitive or involve cognition. Okay, so it's hard for me to answer that without knowing what joint is supposed to be substituted for the joint that I'm suggesting. So what exactly is the joint? Is it the joint between Maybe sensation and perception? I don't know what joint you're talking about. You have to tell me more. So you, basically what you're saying is, all the evidence for the joint I'm talking about might be evidence for a different joint. But I can't really answer that without knowing what the different joint is. <laughs> Fair enough. I, I, I'm not interested in defending this, but I was thinking someone could just say, uh, yeah, I want to endorse all the kind of distinctions you uh, want to make with respect to the things that, uh, the phenomena that seem to characterize perception, but I still want to think that there's a uh, concept, concept for co cognition in some level involved uh, over there. But I, I see the move. Like the, okay, so what you're saying is may, maybe the interpenetration of yeah. perception and cognition is just so complete that there's no joint. It's really what he was saying. You're saying, really, you're saying with all that interpenetration, may, you know, I can make a, uh, a conceptual, dis you know, I can, I can, I can, speak about, uh, make a linguistic distinction between perception and cognition, but who, why should we think it's real, is really what you're saying. Why should we think there's really a separation in nature? I was, well, yeah, I was thinking that 
they could still accept the, that there's some difference between what yeah. happens. So but why is it a joint? Yeah, but why is it a natural joint between okay. perception and cognition? Cognition okay. goes all the way through, yeah. Yeah, next time. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. This is a question for clarification, really. Uh, when, you, when you characterize uh, the, the content of perception there, uh, you, I mean, there's a, an indexical element identifying an individual and some attri attributed pro properties, right? So that suggests something that people have been saying uh, for a long time, that the content of, per I mean, we perceive uh, what we see as particulars. I mean, the, uh, you know, the content of perception involves perceiving something as a particular. So I wanted to ask you whether uh, this property of particularity, uh, do you conceive it as uh, a low level property or a high level property? And uh, well, that's one question. And second, is there any empirical way to show that um, uh, perceiving something as a particular uh, is actually a perceptual effect rather than a cognitive effect? Hmm. Um, hmm. Well, certainly, look, I certainly think of it as a low level, it's just basic in the visual system. It's not, you know, what I'm calling high level properties. So, so look, one index of whether something is high level is whether there could be what I call a recognitional co-extension problem. So I claim face is a high level perceptual representation. And somebody opposed to me can say, well, how do you know it's not a lot of color shapes and textures that are recognitionally coextensive with being a face? I can't even imagine how a similar issue could come up about perceptual particularity. What would be the purported low level analog of particularity? It just seems built in from the very beginning. So I, I, I guess I, I, what I'm saying is it's low level and I can't even see how anybody could get started in claiming that it's high level. But it does seem like a phenomenon, where, uh, an issue worth thinking about. But that, that, anyway, that's my answer now. Uh, Hi. Uh, you suggested that there are cases of seeing as without concept uh, conceptualization, and my question is, are there cases of seeing as that do not involve attention? And the other question is, uh, I don't know if I understood you correctly, but you said that uh, it is possible to attribute causality with perception without conceptualization, and my question is, if causality involves necessity, perception by itself can attribute necessity? Okay, on the last um, issue, um, I, uh, so the, the, a, 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 a perceptual um, attribution of, of causation I think occurs in uh, the, you know, that moving dot thing, the moving disc thing. And, but I think you're right that to say it's causation, of course, when I say it's causation, I'm, I'm using the a t a term, you know, in, 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 uh, that uh, we all have the concept of. So what I really, so, okay, so I think you're right and I should uh, amend what I, what I said. It's not that we have a, um, a perceptual, a purely perceptual, non-conceptual representation of causation. We have, I guess, what you might, what I might, call a, um, a perceptual um, representation of um, the non, I don't quite know how to speak about this. Um, as soon as I utter a word, uh, uh, it's already expressing a concept and it's in a thought. Um, um, maybe I should just say perceptual analog of the concept of causation, a non-conceptual perceptual analog of the concept of causation. And of course, it's part of that. It needn't involve any, any notion of necessity. It's non-conceptual. And of course, the same would be true of face. Um, so um, I'm not saying that, um, you know, I'm saying that what we have in the visual system is a 
non-conceptual analog of our conceptual representation of face or fearful face or, or whatever. So yeah, so I, 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 I haven't got a perfect way of talking about it, but yeah. So, but there was a first point. What was the first point? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Attention. Ah, yes, yes. Um, y yes, I think there are. And uh, one of the, uh, the I think the uh, fifth lecture is. So let me say that there's, uh, um, I've been doing a lot of work in the, over the last few years on the relation between perception and, and attention. And there is a lot of work that shows, I think, pretty conclusively now that you can have attention without conscious perception. The, re the converse of conscious perception without attention is much trickier issue, uh, but I'm gonna argue for one, one such case, and it's gonna be seeing as, as all seeing, since all seeing is seeing as, it's gonna be seeing as without attention. But I, uh, you know, it's a long story. It's kind of follow up, but not doing some uh, art and neuroscience. So, uh, if there is so accepting, I'm pretty convinced that there are high level uh, representations of properties. In the case of faces, the most plausible candidate would be something like the fusiform area. Now, we would expect it to. So, do you know any evidence showing that when the faces are upside down, this area is not firing? Uh, because I would expect it, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just doing, uh, assuming things. So, and if this area is, is firing, we would expect the, the fatigue effect to happen under certain circumstances. So it would affect, and I mean, do you see any interesting, you, you can just comment on this idea how role it would play in the debate between cognitive and. Yeah, well, that's a, I think that's a, a good point that um, since we know a lot about what neur neural systems are doing, some of this recognition, we should be able to look at the neural systems and get some more direct evidence of adaptation. You know, I believe this has been done, but I'm not that aware of the literature. Um, judging from the uh, McCone experiment with the T's, she did get she didn't get a zero effect of adaptation for faces, it was small, but not zero. So in principle, you should be able to find that by using neuroimaging. So there should be a way of applying that. You should, so I guess what I would predict, and I don't know whether anybody's done this, is you get some effect of upside down faces in, in an adaptation to upside down faces in, in face areas like the fusiform face area, but not very big effect. Could someone claim that uh, fatigue is a cognitive process because it only affects, I'm trying to make a kind of argument, uh, because it only affects uh, high level properties under certain circumstances and not others? So it's only when we recognize uh, a phase. So being upside down is something that we recognize in a different way because in some way conceptual. So either way, either conceptual or low level, I mean, play, play the way you prefer, precisely because fatigue uh, has an, a more important effect under some circumstances and, all, and not other in which these areas are fired. Some, something along these lines. Well, okay, so I don't, you know, I don't know, speculating. I don't know any actual experiments on this because, you know, the thing is, once you've got perception, perceptual judgment is so automatic. You'd have to have a case that distinct that where you'd have perception without perceptual judgment. I, I predict that you could that it would be possible to do this, and that you, you would still get perceptual adaptation. But okay, so now we're in the realm of uh, of uh, you know where it's not very hard to know how to do an experiment. Um, at least I don't quite see how. On this same issue, I wonder if you're going to address visual agnosia at some time or another, because uh, there are many types of visual agnosia, but uh, uh, I wonder how this scheme would apply there. I mean, a person with visual agnosia can see, have, they have visual sensations, 
and they can see a baseball bat, but they may not recognize that it's a baseball bat, or they may recognize part of the function of the baseball bat, but not have maybe perceptual judgment about it. I think if, uh, if you dwell into visual agnosia, maybe you can, uh, the experiment is done by nature itself, I mean by a lesion in the brain. Yeah. Uh, uh, have you come into that? Yeah, so I think you just answered uh, um, um, Subas. Um, <laughs> um, and whether, so my prediction is you'll get uh, if people with um, um, uh, uh, visual agnosias will, will, will get adaptation effects. Now, what I don't know is, um, is whether, um, uh, say, prosopagnosia, uh, which is, so agnosia is, uh, an agnosia is a, a, a brain-caused inability to recognize. Now, the question arises as to whether that's a perceptual effect or a cognitive effect. Um, I know of some cases where I, I believe there's reason to think it's a cognitive effect. Um, and that is, in the case of prosopagnosia, the so-called implicit face recognition. Um, this is, these are cases that was first discovered in the, I think, the 80s by a guy named Bauer, that you have these patients who have their some, uh, their, some serious damage in their face recognition system. But they show, um, you know, um, uh, connect, uh, you can do like, uh, uh, you know, when you put something on the skin to measure uh, emotional reactions, they show the emotional reactions of seeing a familiar face, even though they, they cognitively they have no idea who it is. So my guess is in those cases you would certainly get adaptation. But I don't know that anybody studied the, these things. Uh, yeah, um, I don't, yeah, okay, it'd be interesting to, to look at it. You know, I mean, it's a complex issue because you first have to decide whether the agnosia is a purely conceptual agnosia or whether it is actually a visual, a visual system problem. And then if you can find cases that are purely conceptual, you could look at the adaptation of effects and see what, I, yeah, be very, look, I, I, I think this is a, an area that, is, that has very fertile possibilities for you know, making distinctions that uh, empirically, you know, being able to get an empirical handle on distinctions. And I, I, you know, I hope somebody starts doing some of these experiments. So, <laughs> I am interested in the, in the difference between a non-conceptual perception of an F, or that F, and a conceptual perception of that same F. And so I wanna, I wanna understand better the difference between these two. And in particular, I wonder whether there is a phenomenological difference when you're in one perceptual state versus when you're in the other. Can you speak to that? Can you say something about that? Hmm. Um, it's a tricky issue because there's also, you know, unconscious perception and unconscious cognition, which you know we know very right. little about. I'll tell you the the issue that uh, I am really quite uh, concerned with, um, which is take the number that number perception I, I showed, numer approximate numer perception of approximate numerosity. Okay, we can use that immediately in our thought. So on my story, what happens is, is that a percept is then conceptualized to be used in thought. And that is a ubiquitous phenomenon, but what is, as far as I know, there's no, we have no evidence about, is what happens when a percept is conceptualized. Is it, does it have to be Phenomenal? Is it like is it like the use of imagery in thinking? So, I think I just have to answer. I don't know, <laughs> but it's an interesting question and one that uh, is really worth thinking about and looking looking at the at the the, the, the literature and, and you know it's a literature on the border of perception and cognition, a very interesting uh, literature. That um, yeah. Anyway, thank you. 
Thank you for the question. <laughs> Thank you very much. I want, to thank, I want to thank you for asking some great questions. Um, I wish I knew the answers to all of them. Probably <laughs> want to have lunch with Yeah, absolutely, someone. absolutely. So I recorded that. Well,